But um, John, Jonathan Haidt, in this book, he's discussing what he uh, d deems as moral foundations, which, as far as I'm aware, is kind of what he's most well known for. It it's is. the thing that he's very famous for, which is examining the moral foundations that underpin all of human morality and our reasoning, mm. our emotional responses to things, and putting forward the idea uh, that what is not guiding human beings is not reason, first and foremost, and in fact what reason is basically developed for through evolution is to give us good excuses for why we do the things we were already set on doing in the yeah. first place. You so, get a good response, you do it, and then you figure out how you'll explain it later. It's a post hoc rationalization of what we intuitively or habitually were going to do. Yes, and he said in this as well, later on in the book, he talks about how it's, it's for that, basically to come up with excuses and also to convince other people to feel the yeah. way that we do. It's not to convince us why we're doing the right We've thing. We've already done not. it. Yeah, I, I already feel it in my gut, you know, mm. nonce bad, bash nonce, <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain it later. Well, the, the point is we do actually very little deliberation in our daily lives. You know, we take loads of actions and make loads of decisions. We just don't think about them very much. And so these are either intuitive or habituated into uh, our daily lives. And, you know, you think about, you know, why, why did you have what you had for breakfast this morning? About it. Didn't yeah, I deliberate did. on it. You just had it. I think because there are six moral foundations, as he sets out, which are um, loyalty. I think loyalty is one of them. Um, authority, uh, liberty, care and harm. Um, disgust and sanctity, and I think I've probably mixed a few of those up exactly. You can probably just well, get. I them just up. look it up. But yeah, yeah. Some some of the most interesting, <laughs> the, some of the most interesting stuff in there is related to the disgust foundation, yes. the idea of degradation and sanctity, and the disgust response that we get because he formulated specific questions. Well, just to just to hit, catch on that, so it's the care harm foundation. Yes, that's a care harm. Um, the fairness cheating foundation, yep. the loyalty betrayal foundation. The Authority Subversion Foundation. And he adds uh, the. So he's got. No, there are five. The Sanctity Degradation no, Foundation. There's five, and then he, and then adds, he adds one on top, which is. Uh, liberty, liberty Oppression. Liberty and Oppression, yeah. And he found that he needed to add Liberty Oppression because he thought he'd got all of them. But then when he started to write about them and speak to. I think he wrote a paper to li address to liberals and American liberals, obviously, mm. meaning progressives. Uh, trying to explain to them the conservative point of view, and he said that uh, all it made, all that happened was that liberals hated him more for trying to explain why conservatives weren't all just mentally ill. Yeah, and conservatives were kind of split because some of them were saying, "Well, you know, I really appreciate you trying to put our point of view forward in a reasonable way," and then others were saying, "Well, you've completely misrepresented me because you were saying that it was based on um, a fairness." comprehension of proportionality and he and uh, a lot of conservatives were responding to him by saying like well i don't think it's fair or proportional that i should be taken have my money taken by me from the government uh, and then given to freeloaders and people who don't do anything so he realized that okay there's a bit of a split here between the way that the left and the right view fairness mm. and so he put that into liberty oppression yeah which which is very interesting but like i said i, I do find the ones that he did on uh, discussed responses very, very interesting because of the way that it's viewed in the West specifically. Mm. Because he formulated specific questions to try and test Western morality in this way. Like I've got a few of them written down if you want me to go through them. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So the, f uh, the first one is kind of, kind of simple. A lot of people go, Ob obviously that's bad. Where He says, a family's dog was killed by a car in front of their house. They had heard the dog meat was delicious, so they cut up the dog's body and cooked it and ate it for dinner. Nobody saw them do this. And then when, when you finish this question, you go, is that a bad thing? Yes. Have they done a bad thing? Obviously. And obviously most people, because we all love dogs yes. and we all don't want to see dogs disrespected in such a way, say, yeah, that's a bad thing. Well, the dog in this example is a family member. Well, yeah. You know, you've got an emotional attachment to the dog. You're not going to be like, well, I guess I'll eat it then. You know? Yeah, and you recognise that there must be something deeply disturbing about the sorts of people yeah. who would do such a thing. But then he also goes, okay, this this one threw quite a lot of liberals when he yeah. asked this uh, them this question. A man goes to the supermarket once a week and buys a chicken. Before cooking the chicken, he has sex with it, and then he cooks it and eats it. And the liberals like, I don't see anything wrong with yeah. that at all. That's the thing. The liberals were all like, well... I don't like that he did that, <laughs> yeah, sure. but he didn't hurt anybody, though, did he? So I can't say it's definitively wrong. That's amazing, isn't it? It's, it's not wrong unless someone's actively hurt. 
Yeah, that's the thing, because liberals, and you find yeah. that out as you go through the book when he provides some graphs and figures for it. Yeah, I've got it here. Yes. Uh, it's page 184, the, uh, the, I don't know how well you can see it, but there. Uh, so what what this graph shows, and I've, I've referenced this many times because I think this is fascinating, it shows that basically the left are a bunch of extremists, moral extremists. That are, as are libertarians, as you get further into it as well. Yeah, they, well, they, they are basically the same as the left. They just care less about care harm. Yeah, exactly. It, it, exactly. They care more about uh, liberty and oppression, I suppose. But it, it's remarkable because um, the very liberal people uh, don't consider um, loyalty, authority, or sanctity to be in any way important to moral calculations. Uh, they, they, they put that as almost not relevant at all, the most liberal people. And then the most conservative people put care, fairness, loyalty, authority, and sanctity all as quite important, equal importance. About three out of five, basically, is how he's measuring it. And so that's remarkable. The, the conservatives, the very conservative people, have a much more balanced view of morality than the extremely liberal people who literally half of morality doesn't even exist to them. Yes, and that also apl um, suddenly applies to the way that liberals view the world and view conservatives as mm. well, because that means that they, um, when you in encountering questions like the ones that we're talking about yeah. here... Th they think it's okay to F a chicken before you cook Yeah, it. just because of the fact that nobody's harmed, and they see... Th I they see, see no problem with this. Yeah, they, they see the societal standards that <laughs> yeah. are put up there as saying, well, you can't do that, that's obviously a terrible thing to do. For one, you're disgracing yourself. Yeah. By doing such a thing, they see that as a form of oppression, which yes. is where the liberty aspect of their moral foundations I can, come in. I can unironically see some guy with blue hair being like, "You're oppressing me if you say I can't have sex with this chicken before I eat it." It's my, it's my right, goddammit. Yeah, it! Exactly, it's my human right. Yeah, but, and but, I, th but that's the point, isn't it? This this comes down to a sanctity question. You know, are you prepared to debase yourself by having sex with a chicken? and then eating. I mean, just having sex with chicken anyway. Well, I, I find that gr growing up in the era that I did and being surrounded by immature teenagers when I myself was an immature teenager, I was often in in confronted with these kinds of questions. Yeah. Uh, how, uh, how much money would it take for you to do X? Yeah. And one of the questions that I got given in college, and I think looking back, this is one of those like click moments where it's like, okay, I've obviously got already at that point a slightly more conservative mindset than some of the people that I was friends with at the time because they said, okay, you're in a room. Nobody else is there. Nobody will ever know what's in the room. And there's just a dick on the table, uh, sticking out of a table. There's a guy under it. He doesn't know who you are. We'll never be able to tell. Okay, you, you know, that guy, how much money will it take for you to do that? And I said, under no circumstances yeah. would any amount of money convince me to do such a thing. And he was like, well, but no one will know. And I just said, but I'll know. Yeah, exactly. I don't I'll care. know. And I will know that I have disgraced myself yeah. by doing such a thing for yeah. money. But all of my friends at the time were like, oh, well, I would take, you know, if it's five million pounds, you know, it's like, yeah, but that won't, that won't take away yeah. what you just did to do such yeah. a thing. But I, I also think that it comes into that a lot of leftists tend to think, well, if I can't think of a rational reason for why something is bad if i only have to consult my gut to be able to understand that this is a bad thing mm. then it's not legit yeah. it's not a legitimate reason to dislike something or disavow something no, that's exactly right they have to have a rational reason and so they can't think outside of care or fairness like if if you know okay well does it harm someone well no i can't identify any harm well is it unfair? No, no one's being unjustly discriminated against. Then I'm literally incapable of generating a response to why. I mean, you see it like the, with the BBC today. Is incest really bad? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and in, fa in fact, one of the questions that he came up with was an incest question where it's yeah. like, well, you know, brother and sister, she's taking uh, um, the pill, he's yeah. wearing or protection. Gay incest is another yeah, gay incest. Hi hypothetical on that. And it's just like, Look, it doesn't matter what kind of incest it is. I don't care what precautions you've yeah, taken. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It doesn't matter if there's no consequences, no one to know. The thing is intrinsically wrong in and of itself because of the sanctity foundation that Haidt has identified. Yes, and as I mentioned with the rationalistic aspect, he does talk about the fact that for a long while, through I think the 70s and 80s and into the 90s, psychology in the West was... Uh, underpinned by what he refers to as the rationalistic delusion, which he traces all the way back to thinkers like Plato in ancient mm -hmm. Greece, and then you can go through to Jeremy Bentham mm -hmm. and Immanuel Kant, this mm -hmm. idea that 
reason is the ultimate facilitator of all human action. Yeah. All we do, everything we do is purely based off of, I have considered this thoroughly yeah. and will be able to make the best decision based on my reasonable de uh, decision making. No. And notice how he's listing all of the people that I constantly go on about as being absolutely atrocious. Well, the, the funny thing is, <laughs> he, actually has, he actually has a graph in that book on yeah. uh, the autism spectrum. And uh, really? Jeremy Bentham is placed squarely, <laughs> squarely right in the middle of it. And Kant just on the outskirts of it. I mean, if you know anything about Kant's personal life, he was definitely... Definitely yes, he, the, like he des he describes uh, the yeah. life of Ben. Well, B Bentham's and Kant's habits, and when you read them, yeah. you think, okay, these two were massively autistic. Yeah. And he describes that that's why they were such good systematizers, why they were able to come up with these grand rationalistic plans for how human beings should behave. What is it? Kant's categorical imperative: yep. you should only act on the principle that you could apply to literally everybody else in any yep. time and any place, which is completely impossible. And also nonsense. Okay, never lie. Okay, I won't lie. Uh, the Nazis are like, do you have any Jews hiding up there? It's like, sorry, I've got Anne Frank in the back. I mean, well, I'm I not guess, allowed to lie. <laughs> well, I've got to stick to my principles. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I can't say you know. So, yeah, exactly. It's just like... <laughs> it, it is ridiculous. Um, but, yeah, he, he goes on about that, and he talks about how there were quite a few studies done around children in the West mm. that kind of pushed the psychologists into this conclusion. But also... I like that he doesn't bring up the idea of bias in a lot of the psychologists' tests that were done previously because he points out very clearly that the idea of a rationalistic sense of morality that's based almost entirely around the care-harm foundation, because of course when you're a child, hmm. you're not really mature enough to be able to develop many intelligent feelings about something like care, uh, like sanctity and degradation, as we yeah. were mentioning, um, basically justified the idea of the supremacy of a liberal worldview, a liberal progressive worldview, and also justified, if I can go through the quote here, here we go, as an intuition, uh, intuitionist, I'd say that the worship of reason itself is an illusion of one of the most long-lived delusions in Western history, the rationalist delusion. The idea that reasoning is our most valuable, noble attribute which makes us like the gods for Plato brings us all that brings us beyond the delusion of believing in gods for the types of the new atheists, the Sam Harris types. The rationalist delusion is not just a claim about human nature, it's also a claim that the rational caste, philosophers and scientists, should have more power. Oh, yes. And it usually comes along with a utopian program for raising more rational children, or as we're seeing nowadays, just dissuading people from having children altogether. It's the rule of the experts, and if there's one thing the experts have shown, it's A, they're incredibly fallible, B, they're not ex exactly virtuous people. Uh, no, I mean Sam Harris recently saying, you know, f the children. I don't care if, I don't care if um, Hunter Biden's got a bunch of children locked up in his basement. I'm still not voting Trump. Or the expert who imposed lockdowns on us and then broke them. Which one? Uh, well, yeah, which one? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> there were far too many of yeah. them. But one of the interesting things as well is how he points out that this kind of individualistic, rationalistic, purely care harm thinking is something that is actually very very unique mm. to the west he calls it weird morality which is a white educated um you know all the rest of it yeah, yeah, uh, it, like yeah educated something else democratic i did actually just see it a second ago yes um, but that that morality is something almost specifically tied to a, western cultures that's a very good acronym as well it's very uh you got weird morality. So yeah, that's that's true. It is weird. And yeah, it's, uh... and he he quotes he quotes some other psychologists in the first chapter when talking about it. He says uh, Schweder quoted the anthrop anthropologist Clifford Gertz because he refers a lot to anthropology because mm. he talks about how well it's one thing to have. Oh, so yeah, it, Western educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Yes, which is yeah. certainly something unique to the sorts of people that push this worldview. But just a quick aside, look, yeah. he, he's absolutely right in identifying this, and uh, this, is, this is what Oakeshott was talking about with rationalism and politics, and this seems to be the curse of the sort of 20th century, where it's the century of uh, materialism and rationalism. And so anything that we would consider transcendental, such as sanctity, uh, you can't materially define sanctity actually it's a state of feeling right mm. it's a state of affairs it is i have never had sex with a chicken and then eaten it and therefore once i do that state of affairs is broken and i can never get it back uh, and so that's that's a 
transcendental view, you know, it's metaphysical. And so it, it, the, the fact that it's the sort of materialistic, rationalistic 20th century that he is essentially repudiating entirely saying, look, we're actually, uh, kind of mystical in a way, you know, we, mm. we, we kind of feel things. I, th I think even beyond that, it's, it's relevant to be able to say that just because you're doing something behind closed doors yeah. doesn't mean it doesn't reflect on your character Absolutely. outside it's i mean loyalty is another one you know like they can't understand the concept of loyalty it's like really that's very clear <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah every day i see more and more <laughs> yeah. examples of that yeah but it's it's just remarkable because i mean again loyalty it, it's it's a moral feeling you know it's not something you can measure uh but it's it's also something that's deeply important and binds everything together you know and so like the idea that for, for example, for the left, it's not wrong to lie. You know, part of the loyalty we have to one another is to tell the truth. You know, mm. to be honest with one another. That's a, that's a feature of loyalty. And well, if they don't value loyalty, well, then I'll just lie to you. I don't care. Well, that's the thing that is that they have no loyalty, yeah. like you say. But I think what what's also important to note is that... Hyde, sanctity as well. Yeah, Height himself is a, uh American liberal. He's um, not really that. Well, well, he... Not he really. he was, and he describes himself as <laughs> yeah. being, but like he describes throughout the book as you go on this journey with him, how he started off as just a typical, basically American leftist, thinking, oh, all these Republicans are crazy, conservatives are crazy, yeah. yada, yada, yada. And then as he does more and more research and starts to understand how morality across the world seems to function, as well as understand some of the more philosophical underpinnings of conservatives, he begins more and more to understand where they're coming from, which is why uh, he can describe himself writing a, an article describing to liberals how conservatism isn't a mental illness, how they're just people who care about different things. Uh, than Actually, you it do. might be you that have the mental illness. Well, I mean, they proudly display it on their Twitter <laughs> bios. Exactly. They wear badges saying but, neurodivergent. But this is the point. Like, Jonathan Haidt is essentially reversing all of this around, going, no, I think you're the mental one, actually, because you don't care about loyalty, authority, or sanctity. Well, I mean, to, to really put a pin on that i i found this quote from the last chapter remarkable when he was the very famous study that he did where he got uh, liberals and conservatives to try and pretend they were on the other side of the aisle mm. and see how mm. accurately they would answer certain questions <laughs> liberals did not do well conservatives because we also feel care and uh, care yeah. harm and, fa uh, and fairness were able to ac uh, accurately define yeah. how liberals would respond to certain questions liberals because they don't care at all about loyalty sanctity authority they can't understand it they had no understanding whatsoever and he said here uh, the results were clear and consistent moderates and conservatives were most accurate in their predictions whether they were pretending to be liberals or conservatives liberals were the least accurate especially those who described themselves as very liberal the biggest errors in the whole study came when liberals answered the care and fairness questions while pretending to be conservatives. When faced with questions such as, one of the worst things a person could do is hurt a defenseless animal, or justice is the most important thing requirement for a society, liberals assumed that conservatives would disagree. <laughs> they literally think that conservatives are heartless psychopaths that enjoy hurting animals for no reason. They think we're less than human, But the conservatives are the only ones with a reason not to eat your family pet. Well, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter to them. The, the contradictions don't matter, as it's been they made clear. They've got their gut feeling, which yeah. is that you shouldn't hurt animals, but effing animals is perfectly fine. If it's dead, there's no one's hurt, is there? Yeah. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.